Thank you so much for having me here. Um, Narada, Dean Singer, and Segi, of course. This is my first event with you. I've been to a couple of your events, and they're always wonderful. It's also particularly touching uh, that the word means respect. And as I was preparing uh, today's talk, that's the one thought that came to my mind so many times, that women like us who are definitely in positions of privilege, how many times do we go through the day and feel, well, I said something, but was I really heard? How many times do we feel that we are at the table but not really equal, not really respected. And I do not know the um, answer to that, but it's certainly one thought that we have to devote some time to. Uh, today, given the limited time I have, I want to do two things. One is challenge some of the dominant narratives that have emerged in the wake of the recent I think what has been rightly called the rape epidemic. But it began in India in a certain way that caught the global imaginary in a very different way. So I want to challenge some of the narratives that have emerged in that context. And I also want to examine some of the solutions that have emerged, how far we can work with them, how should we, uh, whether we should be optimistic or not. And I should tell you at the outset that I'm consistently blamed of being too optimistic. But I derive my optimism from the women who struggle against insurmountable challenges and yet continue to struggle. If they can be optimistic, I don't think we have any right not to be. But I'm guilty as charged. Um, let me begin with a story that is very much on our minds here in Canada. I want to begin in Bangladesh. I think it's a kind of gender violence that we need to speak about to give us a frame about how to understand gender violence. I think it is a multiple tragedy where not only women work under exploitative conditions at the cost of their life, but more importantly, it is not even recognized as violence. It is lauded as development. And there is, for, for a very long time, workers in Bangladesh and in many different countries who work in these conditions have been challenging this model and development. But they have not had a voice because we have forgotten that development of this kind is not really development. So I want to begin with this broader frame of structural violence uh, on women, against women, and to come then to the most important narrative that has emerged, which is the question of culture. So when the rape happened in India in December 2012, I don't know how many times since then, and I'm sure many of you have experienced it uh, like me, have been asked, so India, does India have a culture of rape? Is it a culture of rape? And I have really struggled to answer this question because yes, we have seen a spate of rapes. We have uh, 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 very uh, difficult statistics to grapple with. We've even had very recently a spate of child rapes. But why can I not bring myself to call it a culture of rape? And it's very difficult because everybody thinks I would be an apologist for India. I love India dearly, but I will not condone rape. The reason why I refuse to call a culture or any culture a culture of rape is because how do I define culture if the patriarchy and the rape is one marker of that culture, the resistance of women from time immemorial to all forms of patriarchy in every society is also a marker of culture. And I refuse to define a culture by only one moment which completely overlooks the other because there are serious costs of doing so. At the same time, uh, there is a culture of rape which we see unfolding really globally. So this, is, this was a very familiar picture. You would see one of those uh, in, the break, in the wake of the rape in India. Oh. The clicker doesn't click. This, again, a picture of rape in India, but a different picture. These are uh, women who are from minorities, which we in India call uh, low caste, the backward caste, which is a terrible term, but that's how it's defined. 
the political term is Dalit. Dalit women also have a tremendous history of rape, which is not only simply rape with alcohol or pornography, but institutionalized uh, rape, which is a response to women defying power. And they had a very similar, uh, um, a similar outpouring of uh, uh, their resistance against rape. Then this is Ohio, which happened only a few days after that. Steubenville had that horrible incidence of rape. Then this is Nova Scotia, Canada, where this young woman, woman was not only raped, but she committed suicide because she felt the entire system had failed her. And then another unspoken uh, history of rape in Canada. You must have seen this project of faceless dolls, which the Native Women's Association of Canada has put up, which presents the history of murder and rape of um, Native women. So from India to right to our uh, door, and then of course not to mention the importance or the um, commonality of sexual assault on campuses in North America, where it is now uh, uh, acknowledged that one in four women in a university campus would either face sexual assault, attempted rape, or rape. So there is, in fact, a global culture of rape. And it may take specific forms in specific geographies or specific histories, but I think we lose a lot by trying to pin it to communities and countries rather than acknowledging that there is a global culture of violence against women. Because this silences particular communities, and I'm going to come to the question of silencing very soon. So I had the end the culture of rape, that was actually a slogan from Ohio where they specifically use the term culture of rape. It has been used almost in every context because there is a global culture. Now, if we acknowledge this globality, there are at least three phenomena which mark this global culture of rape or more generally violence against women. And very, um, very this is a very, very uh, thin uh, uh, theorization, if you would like to call it so, but just a few pointers which is objectification, commodification, and defining ma masculinity as power. These are the three things, I think, which are completely global. Now, on objectification, uh, this has been a part of women's struggle for a very long time. And media, uh, the cultural tools like film, and now uh, many other forms of media are very important aspects where women are objectified. And again, when the rape in India happened, there was a lot of discussion on the objectification of women in India and Indian media and Indian films. But don't forget that in Canada, two provincial governments, I think in Ontario and BC, have supported with millions of dollars this uh, Bollywood industry to, to bring it here, which women have said is a very important vehicle of objectification of women. Commodification is again, it's related to the problem of objectification, but women are commodified not only in the cultural realm, but more importantly now, I feel, in the realm of work. There is a whole new political economy, the, end, the new development paradigms are all based on competitive cost structures which require the employer to extract the most possible work from a woman at the least possible cost. And even when there are men working in these industries, the work is entirely feminized. There is a certain model of work and a certain model of setting up development which are based on low paid wage work for women without any rights to workers. And again, going back to India and its global reach, when we talked about call centers, India's call center and IT industry has been lauded, yet it is in the call center where women for a long time have said that they have felt sexual abuse, verbal abuse, and other forms of exploitation and work which nobody paid attention to because that was a growth engine. The third point, which is defining mas masculinity as power, either to amass wealth or to occupy positions of power, or to subjugate women and increasingly children. This is why we see, again, a global epidemic of child uh, abuse and child rape. 
And there is, there is really a kind of re reinforcement of thinking of masculinity as power. We see this in a lot of our uh, young people, and we see this most violently expressed in the rapes in Steubenville and in the rape that led uh, Raitia to uh, commit suicide. So, two, okay. So I have two more minutes and I have to discuss the solutions. I, I'll go through it really quickly. The first one I think which is really important is to reject the silencing narrative. So Western women apparently have no right to talk about sexual assault in the West because we are so privileged. Look at what's happening in India. Look at what is happening in somewhere else. So you cannot talk about this. This is usually a problem of modern versus backward culture, Canadian versus immigrant, or Canadian versus First Nation. This is a very, this is worked as a very important silencing tool, and we need to reject it. Any rape, any violence, anywhere is worthy of discussion by anyone. There are no positions of privilege which should prevent us from talking about violence against women. The third one is, this is for the first time in my lifetime, I'm seeing again from India to Ohio to everywhere else, that the onus of violence has shifted from the victim to the perpetrator. The first time, and I had several of this, you will see everywhere in the world, where they say, don't get raped, don't rape. Teach your sons not to rape, don't tell me what to wear. This has gone on globally, and I think this is a very important point in the empowerment of young women, and we need to, again, endorse this as much as we can. The final one, again, what I have seen very closely in India, which is my cause for optimism, is that the young people, youth, who have been very anti-state, dis disengaged from the state and any ethos of the public, have come out on the streets basically to claim their public space. So we have seen protests like this, one after the other, in many uh, instances. And in India, I think the protests from the young people have been the most comprehensive against the police, against the legal system, against their fathers, against the educational system, against uh, the political class, and the ministers, and their cohorts. And I think this kind of reclaiming a public space and reclaiming the state where we are asking for the state to deliver what it should and taking up active citizenship to make sure that the state delivers what it should is a very important new, I think it's new, uh, trend that we are seeing among young people who have been very disengaged from the state and any kind of public. And I think particularly from our university standpoint, this re-engaging with the state and the public and the collective and de-emphasizing the individual is a very important trajectory through which we can challenge the structural violence against women. Thank you.